From the Conference Center in Salt Lake City, Utah, this is the Saturday evening session of the 194th Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from leaders of the church. Music for this session is provided by the Utah Valley Institute Choir. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. Elder Dale G. Renlin of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles will conduct this session. Brothers and sisters, welcome to the Saturday evening session of the 194th Annual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Russell M. Nelson, who is viewing this session from home, has asked me to conduct this session. We welcome all who are participating in these proceedings by radio, television, the internet, or satellite transmission. The music for this session will be provided by the Utah Valley Institute Choir under the direction of Matt Johnson and Marshall McDonald, with Linda Margetts and Joseph Peoples at the organ. The choir will open this meeting by singing, The Lord is My Light. The invocation will then be offered by Elder Alfred Kyungu of the Seventy. After the prayer, the choir will sing, Oh, What Songs of the Heart.
Dear Father in heaven, how grateful we are this afternoon and this evening to gather together to attend this wonderful session. We thank thee for thy son, Jesus Christ, our savior. We are so grateful for his life, his teaching, and his example, and his atoning sacrifice. We are so grateful for President Rasim Nelson, our beloved prophet, for President Ox, and President Iring, and all the members of the community of apostles that we sustain and love so much. We pray for them. We pray for their leadership. We pray for their health. We pray for all our missionaries and their leaders all over the world. Bless them with more courage as they are going out to invite others to come unto thee and to the Savior Jesus Christ. We are so grateful for this opportunity we have to be part of the gathering of Israel in both sides of the veil. We ask thee, Father, to bless us with thy spirit so that we may continue to learn from thee to the teachings and messages that we'll hear this evening. Bless all the speakers so that they may be inspired, so that we may increase our desire to save thee and to save our neighbors. We are so grateful for the blessing that we have and the all miracles that are happening in our lives. We love thee, Father. We love thy son, Jesus Christ. And we say these things in the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
We'll now be pleased to hear from Elders Shane M. Bowen and Stephen R. Bangeter of the 70. Following their remarks, the choir will sing, Count Your Blessings. We'll then hear from Sister Andrea M. Spinaus, who serves as second counselor in the Young Women General Presidency. She'll be followed by Elder Matthew L. Carpenter of the 70. Many today say that miracles no longer exist, that angels are fictional, and that the heavens are closed. I testify that miracles have not ceased, angels are among us, and the heavens are truly open. When our Savior Jesus Christ was on the earth, he gave priesthood keys to his chief apostle, Peter. Through these keys, Peter and the other apostles led the Savior's church. But when those apostles died, the keys of the priesthood were taken from the earth. I testify that the ancient keys of the priesthood have been restored. Peter, James, and John, and other ancient prophets appeared as resurrected beings, bestowing upon the prophet Joseph Smith what the Lord described as the keys of my kingdom and a dispensation of the gospel. Those keys have, those same keys have been passed from prophet to prophet until today. The 15 men we sustain as prophets, seers, and revelators use them to lead the Savior's Church. As in ancient times, there is one senior apostle who holds and is authorized to exercise all priesthood keys. He is President Russell M. Nelson, prophet and president of the restored Church of Christ in our day, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Through the Savior's Church, we receive the blessings of the priesthood, including the power of God to help us in our lives. Under authorized priesthood keys, we make sacred promises to God and receive sacred ordinances that prepare us to live in His presence. Beginning with baptism and confirmation, and then in the temple, we move forward on a path of covenants that leads us back to Him. With hands laid on our heads, we also receive priesthood blessings, including direction, comfort, counsel, healing, and the power to follow Jesus Christ. Throughout my life, I have been blessed by this great power. As revealed in Scripture, we refer to it as the power of the holy Melchizedek priesthood. In my youth, I gained a great respect for this power, especially as it was manifest in priesthood blessings. While serving as a young missionary in Chile, my companion and I were arrested and separated. We were never told why. It was a time of great political upheaval. Thousands of people were taken into custody by the military police and never heard from again. After being interrogated, I sat alone in a jail cell, not knowing if I would ever see my loved ones again. I turned to my Heavenly Father, fervently pleading, Father, I have always been taught that Thou watcheth over Thine missionaries. Please, Father, I am nothing special, but I have been obedient, and I need Thy help tonight. The seeds of this help had been planted many years earlier. After my baptism, I was confirmed a member of the Church and given the gift of the Holy Ghost. As I prayed, alone behind bars, the Holy Ghost immediately came to me and comforted me. He brought to my mind a very special passage from my patriarchal blessing, which is another blessing of the priesthood. In it, God promised me that through my faithfulness I would be able to be sealed in the temple for time and eternity to a woman full of beauty and virtue and love, that we would become the parents of precious sons and daughters, that I would be blessed and magnified as a father in Israel. Those inspired words about my future filled my soul with peace. I knew that they had come from my loving Heavenly Father, who always keeps His promises. In that moment, I had the assurance that I would be released and live to see those promise, promises fulfilled. About a year later, Heavenly Father did bless me with a wife who is full of beauty and virtue and love. Lynette and I were sealed in the temple. We were blessed with three precious sons and four precious daughters. I became a father, all according to God's promises and the patriarchal blessing I received as a 17-year-old boy. 
Wherefore, my beloved brethren and sisters, have miracles ceased because Christ hath ascended into heaven? Nay, neither have angels ceased to minister unto the children of man. I testify that miracles and ministrations are continually occurring in our lives, often as a direct result of priesthood power. Some priesthood blessings are fulfilled immediately in ways we can see and understand. Others are unfolding gradually and will not be fully realized in this life, but God keeps all of His promises always, as illustrated in this account from our family history. My paternal grandfather, Grant Reese Bowen, was a man of great faith. I vividly remember hearing him recount how he received his own patriarchal blessing. In his journal, he recorded, The patriarch promised me the gift of healing. He said, The sick shall be, de shall be healed, yea, the dead shall be raised under your hands. Years later, Grandfather was piling hay when he felt prompted to return to the house. He was met by his father coming toward him. Grant, your mother has just passed away, his father said. I quote again from Grandfather's journal. I didn't stop but went hurrying into the house and out on the front porch where she lay on a cot. I looked at her and could see that there was no sign of life left in her. I remembered my patriarchal blessing and the promise that, it, that if I were faithful, through my faith, the sick would be healed and the dead would be raised. I placed my hands on her head, and I told the Lord that if the promise that He had made to me by the patriarch was true, to make it manifest at this time and raise my mother back to life. I promised Him if He would do this, I should never hesitate to do all in my power for the building up of, the, of His kingdom. As I prayed, she opened her eyes and said, Grant, raise me up. I have been in the spirit world, but you have called me back. Let this always be a testimony to you and to the rest of my family. President Russell M. Nelson has taught us to seek and expect miracles. I testify that because the priesthood has been restored, the power and authority of God are upon the earth. Through callings and councils, men and women, young and old, can participate in priesthood work. It is a work of miracles attended by angels. It is the work of heaven, and it blesses all God's children. In 1989, our family of seven was returning from a ward outing. It was late. Lynette was expecting our sixth child. She felt a strong prompting to fasten her seatbelt, which she had forgotten to do. Shortly thereafter, we came around a bend in the road. A car crossed the line into our lane. Going about 70 miles an hour, I swerved to avoid hitting the oncoming car. Our van rolled, skidded down the highway, and slid off the road, finally coming to a stop, landing with the passenger side in the dirt. The next thing I remember hearing was Lynette's voice, Shane, we need to get out through your door. I was hanging in the air by my seatbelt. It took a few seconds to get oriented. We started lifting each of the children out of the van through my window which was now the ceiling of the van. They were crying, wondering what had happened. We soon realized that our 10-year-old daughter, Emily, was missing. We yelled her name, but there was no response. Ward members who were also traveling home were at the scene frantically looking for her. It was so dark. I looked in the van again with a flashlight and, to my horror, saw Emily's tiny body trapped under the van. I called out desperately, We have to lift the van off of Emily. I grabbed the roof and pulled back. There were only a few others lifting, but the van miraculously flipped onto its wheels, exposing Emily's lifeless body. Emily was not breathing. Her face was the color of a purple plum. I said, We need to give her a blessing. A dear friend and ward member knelt with me and by the authority of the Melchizedek priesthood, in the name of Jesus Christ, we commanded her to live. In that moment, Emily took a long, raspy breath. After what seemed like hours, the ambulance finally arrived. Emily was rushed to the hospital. She had a collapsed lung and a severed tendon in her knee. Brain damage was a concern because of the time she was without oxygen. Emily was in a coma for a day and a half. We continued to pray and fast for her. She was blessed with a full recovery. Today, Emily and her husband, Kevin, are the parents of six daughters. 
Miraculously, everyone else was able to walk away. The baby Lynette was carrying was Tyson. He too was spared any harm and was born the next February. Eight months later, after receiving his earthly body, Tyson returned home to Heavenly Father. He is our guardian angel's son. We feel his influence in our family and look forward to being with him again. Those who lifted the van off of Emily observed that the van seemed to weigh nothing. I knew that heavenly angels had joined with earthly angels to lift the vehicle off of Emily's body. I also know that Emily was brought back to life by the power of the holy priesthood. The Lord revealed this truth to his servants. For I will go before your face. I will be on your right hand and on your left, and my spirit shall be in your hearts, and mine angels round about you to bear you up. I testify that the holy priesthood, after the order of the Son of God, the Melchizedek priesthood, with its keys, authority, and power, has been restored to the earth in these the latter days. I know that while not all circumstances turn out like we may hope and pray for, God's miracles will always come according to His will, His timing, and His plan for us. If you desire the blessings of the priesthood, including miracles and the ministry of angels, I invite you to walk the path of covenants God has made available to each of us. Members and leaders of the Church who love you will help you take the next step. I testify that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, lives and leads His Church through living prophets who hold and exercise priesthood keys. The Holy Ghost is real. The Savior gave His life to heal us, reclaim us, and bring us home. I witness that miracles have not ceased. Angels are among us, and the heavens are open. And oh, how open they are. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. This evening, I speak to the youth of the Church, the rising generation of young men and young women who are the standard bearers for the next generation. In October 2013, our beloved prophet, President Russell M. Nelson, declared, quote, Your Heavenly Father has known you for a very long time. You, as His son or daughter, were chosen by Him to come to the earth at this precise time to be a leader in His great work on earth. Two years ago, President Nelson continued, Today I reaffirm strongly that the Lord has asked every worthy, able young man to prepare for and serve a mission. For Latter-day Saint young men, missionary service is a priesthood responsibility. You young men have been reserved for this time when the promised gathering of Israel is taking place. For you young and able sisters, a mission is also a powerful but optional opportunity. Pray to know if the Lord would have you serve a mission, and the Holy Ghost will respond to your heart and mind." Our prophet's references to the Lord holding the youth of our day in reserve for this time in the gathering of Israel and his invitation to pray to know what the Lord would have you do are, in part, references to the life you lived and blessings you received from God before you were ever born on this earth. All of us who are born on this earth first lived with our Heavenly Father as His spirit children. The Lord declared to Moses, I, the Lord God, created all things spiritually before they were naturally upon the face of the earth. When He created you spiritually, He loved you as His spirit sons and daughters and embedded within each of you a divine nature and eternal destiny. During your premortal life, you developed your identity and increased your spiritual capabilities. You were blessed with the gift of agency, the ability to make choices for yourself, and you did make important decisions, such as the decision to follow our Heavenly Father's plan of happiness, which is to obtain a physical body and gain earthly experience to progress and ultimately 
realize your divine destiny as heirs of eternal life. This decision affected your life then, in your premortal life, and it continues to affect your life now. As a child of God living in your premortal life, you grew in intelligence and you learned to love the truth. Before you were born, God appointed each of you to fulfill specific missions during your mortal life upon this earth. If you remain worthy, the blessings of that premortal decree will enable you to have all kinds of opportunities in this life, including opportunities to serve in the church and to participate in the most important work happening on the earth today, the gathering of Israel. Those premortal promises and blessings are called your foreordination. The doctrine of foreordination applies to all members of the church. Foreordination does not guarantee that you will receive certain callings or responsibilities. Those blessings and opportunities come in this life as a result of your righteous exercise of agency, just as your foreordination in your premortal life came as a result of righteousness. As you prove yourself worthy and progress along the covenant path, you will receive opportunities to serve in your young women class or priesthood quorum. You will be blessed to serve in the temple, to become a ministering brother or sister, and to serve a mission as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Why does it matter to seek to know and understand your foreordination? In a day when questions abound, when so many seek to know their true identity, the fact that God knows and has blessed each one of us individually before we were ever born on this earth with essential characteristics of premortal, mortal, and eternal identity and purpose brings sweet peace and assurance to our mind and our heart. Knowing who you are begins with understanding God's foreordained blessings bestowed upon you before you were ever born on this earth. Our Heavenly Father desires to reveal to you your personal foreordination, and He will do so as you seek to learn and follow His will. I love to read President Nelson's Instagram posts. One of my favorites was on July 20, 2022. He wrote, I believe that if the Lord were speaking to you directly, the first thing He would make sure you understand is your true identity. My dear friends, you are literally spirit children of God. Make no mistake about it. Your potential is divine. With your diligent seeking, God will give you glimpses of who you may become. May I share with you how my earthly father taught me to discover my identity and God's plan in my life. One Saturday morning when I was 13 years old, I was mowing the grass as part of my weekly chores. When I finished, I heard the door close at the back of our house and looked to see my father calling me to join him. I walked to the back porch and he invited me to sit with him on the steps. It was a beautiful morning. I still recall him sitting so close that our shoulders were touching. He began by telling me he loved me. He asked me what my goals were in life. I thought, well, that's easy. I knew two things for sure. I wanted to be taller, and I wanted to go camping more. <laughs> I was a simple soul. He smiled and paused for a moment and said, Steve, I'd like to share something with you that's very important to me. I've prayed that our Heavenly Father will cause what I say now to be indelibly imprinted on your mind and on your soul so that you'll never forget. My Father had my full attention in that moment. He turned to me, looked me in the eyes, and said, Son, protect the private times of your life. 
There was a long pause as he let the meaning sink deep into my heart. He then continued, you know those times when you're the only one around and no one else knows what you're doing. Those times when you think whatever I do now doesn't affect anyone else, only me. Then he said, more than any other time in your life, what you do during the private times of your life will have the greatest impact on how you confront challenges and heartache you will face. And what you do during the private times of your life will have a greater impact on how you confront successes and joy you will experience than any other time in your life. My father received the wish of his heart. The sound and cadence of his voice, the love I felt in his words, were indelibly imprinted in my mind and on my soul that day. I have learned over the years that the greatest miracle of that day on the steps of my childhood home was that, in the private times of my life, I could go to God in prayer to receive revelation. My father was teaching me how I could learn of God's foreordained blessings. In those private moments, I learned the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. I learned God had foreordained me to serve a mission. And I learned that God knows me and He hears and answers my prayers. I learned that Jesus is the Christ, our Savior and our Redeemer. Though I have made many mistakes since that memorable day with my father, striving to protect the private times of my life has remained an anchor amid the storms of life and has enabled me to seek safe haven and the healing, strengthening blessings of our Savior's love and atoning sacrifice. My young brothers and sisters, as you protect the private times of your life with wholesome recreation, listening to uplifting music, reading the scriptures, having regular meaningful prayer, and making efforts to receive and ponder your patriarchal blessing, you will receive revelation. In President Nelson's words, your eyes will become wide open to the truth that this life really is the time when you get to decide what kind of life you want to live forever. Our Heavenly Father will answer your prayers, especially your prayers offered during the private times of your life. He will reveal to you your foreordained gifts, talents, and blessings. You will feel His love envelop you if you will sincerely ask and genuinely desire to know. As you protect the private times of your life, your participation in the ordinances and covenants of the gospel will be more meaningful, and you will more fully bind yourself to God in the covenant you make with Him, and you will be lifted to have greater hope, faith, and assurance in the promises God has made to you. Do you want to know God's plan for you? I bear witness He wants you to know and he's inspired his prophet to the world to invite you to pray and receive this eye-opening experience. I bear witness of the truth of these things and the reality of Jesus Christ in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Dear young friends, today I would like to speak directly to you, the youth of the church. It's been a year since our Young Women General Presidency was called, and how much has happened in this past year. We have met many of you and have studied the teachings of Christ together. We have sung songs, made new friends, and served with you in our communities. We have been strengthened by listening to your testimonies at youth conferences and world events. And we have worshiped together in the house of the Lord. Each time we have shared a message from our Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight will not be different. I have a message for you, the youth of the Church of Jesus Christ. Have you ever wondered how you can be faithful to God while living in a world of sin? Where do you get the strength to go forward and continue doing good? How do you experience true joy? I think the experience of David and Goliath can help. In the Old Testament, the army of the Philistines was battling the Israelites, and every morning and every evening, a giant Philistine named Goliath challenged any Israelite to fight him. Among the Israelite people lived David, a, much, a young shepherd, much smaller than Goliath, but with a giant faith in Jesus Christ. David volunteered to fight. Even the king tried to dissuade him, but David chose to put his trust in Jesus Christ. Previously, David had fought a lion and also a bear. From his experience, he knew that God had protected him and made him victorious. To David, the cause of God was the most important cause. So, full of faith in a God who would not abandon him, he gathered five smooth stones, took up his sling, and went to face the giant. The scriptures tell us that the first stone David threw hit Goliath's forehead, ending his life. While David used only one stone to kill Goliath, he was prepared with five. With five! This made me think about how I can prepare myself to face the world. What if each of David's stones represented a strength we need to be triumphant in our lives? What could those five stones be? I thought of these possibilities. The stone of my love for God, the stone of my faith in our Savior Jesus Christ, the stone of the knowledge of my true identity, the stone of my daily repentance, and the stone of my access to God's power. Let's talk about how we are blessed by these strengths. First, the stone of my love for God. Loving God is the first great commandment. The For the Strength of Youth Guide teaches us, God loves you. He is your Father. His perfect love can inspire you to love Him. When your love for Heavenly Father is the most important influence in your life, many decisions become easier. Our love for God and our close relationship with Him give us the strength we need to transform our hearts and more easily overcome our challenges. 
Second, the stone of my faith in our Savior, Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ came to earth, he suffered for our sins and he took upon himself our sorrows, our pains, our weaknesses, and our physical and mental illnesses. That's why he knows how to help us. Having faith in Jesus Christ means to fully trust his wisdom, his timing, his love, and his power to atone for our sins. The stone of faith in Jesus Christ will defeat any giant in our lives. We can overcome this fallen world because he overcame it first. Number three, the stone of the knowledge of my true identity. Our beloved prophet, President Russell M. Nelson, taught us that our most important identities are as children of God, children of the covenant, and disciples of Jesus Christ. Everything changes when I know who I really am. When I doubt my abilities, I often repeat to myself in my mind or out loud, I am a daughter of God. I am a daughter of God as many times as I need until I again feel confident to keep going. Four, the stone of my daily repentance. In For the Strength of Youth, we read, Repentance isn't punishment for sin. It is the way the Savior frees us from sin. To repent means to change, to turn away from sin and toward God. It means to improve and receive forgiveness. This kind of change is not a one-time event. It's an ongoing process. Nothing is more liberating than feeling God's forgiveness and knowing that we are clean and reconciled with him. Forgiveness is possible for everyone. The fifth stone is the stone of my access to God's power. The covenants we make with God, such as those we make in the ordinance of baptism, give us access to the power of godliness. God's power, it's a real power that helps us face challenges, make good decisions, and increase our capacity to endure difficult situations. It's a power with which we can grow in the specific abilities that we need. The For the Strength of Youth Guide explains, Covenants connect you to Heavenly Father and the Savior. They increase God's power in your life. Let's talk about that connection. Remember when Christ taught the difference between a house built on rock and one on sand? Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf explained, a house doesn't survive in a storm because the house is strong. It also doesn't survive just because the rock is strong. The house survives the storm because it is firmly attached to that strong rock. It's the strength of the connection to the rock that matters. Our personal connection to Jesus Christ will give us the courage and confidence to move forward amid people who do not respect our beliefs or who bully us. Christ invites us to keep him in our thoughts constantly. He tells us, look unto me in every thought. Thinking about that the Savior gives us clarity of mind to make decisions, to act without fear, and to say no to what is contrary to God's teachings. When my day is difficult and I feel like I can't take anymore, thinking about Christ brings me peace and gives me hope. How can we draw upon this power of Jesus Christ? Obeying our covenants and increasing our faith in Jesus Christ are key. I actually wish David had had one more stone. That would be the stone of my testimony. Our testimony is built 
by personal spiritual experiences in which we recognize the divine influence in our lives. No one can take that knowledge from us. Knowing what we know from having lived our spiritual experiences is priceless. Being true to that knowledge give us freedom, it give us joy. If we love the truth, we will seek it. And once we find it, we will defend it. Just as I chose stone number six, I invite you to meet with your class, quorum, or family and think about what other strengths we need to acquire to remain faithful to God and therefore overcome the world. Dear friends, Christ is eager to accompany us on the journey of our lives. I promise you, as you hold onto the iron rod, you will walk hand in hand with Jesus Christ. He will be guiding you and he will be teaching you. By his hand, you will be able to bring down every Goliath that appears in your life. I testify that there is joy in praying every day, in reading the Book of Mormon every day, in partaking of the sacrament every Sunday, and in going to seminary, even in the early morning. There is joy in doing good. There is joy in being faithful to the God of the universe, the Savior of the world, the King of Kings. There is joy in being a disciple of Jesus Christ. God is our Father. He knows your heart's desires and your possibilities, and he trusts you. Dear youth, Jesus Christ will help you to be faithful to the end. Of these truths, I bear my testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. As a young boy, I loved fresh, ripe peaches. To this day, the idea of biting into a juicy, ripe peach with its tangy flavor makes my mouth water. When fully matured peaches are picked, they last two to four days before they spoil. I have fond memories of joining with my mother and my siblings in our kitchen as we would preserve harvested peaches for the coming winter by sealing them in bottles. If we preserve the peaches correctly, this delicious fruit would last several years, not just two to four days. For peaches, if properly prepared and heated, the fruit is preserved until the seal is broken. Christ directed us to go and bring forth fruit that your fruit should remain. But he wasn't speaking about peaches. He was talking about God's blessings to his children. If we make and keep covenants with God, the blessings associated with our covenants can extend beyond this life and be sealed upon us or preserved forever, becoming fruit that remains for all eternity. The Holy Ghost, in His divine role as the Holy Spirit of promise, will seal each ordinance upon those who are faithful to their covenants so that they will be valid after mortality. Having the Holy Ghost seal our ordinances is essential if we want to have the promised blessings for all eternity becoming fruit that remains. This is particularly important if we want to be exalted. As President Nelson has taught, quote, we should begin with the end in mind. Surely for each of us, the end we would most like to achieve is to live forever with our families in an exalted state where we will be in the presence of God, our Heavenly Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ." End of quote. President Nelson has also said, celestial marriage is a pivotal part of preparation for eternal life. It requires one to be married in the right, uh, pardon me, married to the right person in the right place by the right authority, and to obey that sacred covenant faithfully then one may be assured of exaltation in the celestial kingdom of God. What are the blessings of exaltation? They include dwelling in God's presence for eternity together as husband and wife, 
inheriting thrones, kingdoms, principalities, and powers, and a continuation of the seeds forever and ever, receiving all that God the Father has. The Lord revealed through Joseph Smith, in the celestial glory, there are three heavens or degrees. And in order to obtain the highest, a man must enter into this order of the priesthood, meaning the new and everlasting covenant of marriage, And if he does not, he cannot obtain it. He may enter into the other, but that is the end of his kingdom. He cannot have an increase. We learn here that one can be in the celestial kingdom or dwell in the presence of God and be single. But to be exalted in the highest degree of the celestial kingdom, one must enter into marriage by the proper authority and then be true to the covenants made in that marriage. As we are faithful to these covenants, the Holy Spirit of promise can seal our marriage covenant. Such sealed blessings become fruit that remains. What is required to faithfully keep the new and everlasting covenant of marriage? President Russell M. Nelson has taught that there are two types of bonds when we enter into this eternal marriage covenant, a lateral bond between husband and wife and a vertical bond with God. To have the blessings of exaltation sealed upon us and remain after this life, we must be true to both the lateral and the vertical bonds of the covenant. To keep the lateral bond with your spouse, God has counseled us to love your wife or husband with all your heart and cleave unto her or him and none else. For those who are married, to cleave unto her or him and none else means you counsel together in love. You love and care for each other. You prioritize time with your spouse over outside interests. And you call upon God to help you overcome your weaknesses. It also means there is no emotional intimacy or sexual relations of any kind outside of your marriage, including flirting or dating, and there is no pornography which engenders lust. To keep the lateral bond in the covenant, each partner must desire to be in the marriage. President Dallin H. Oaks recently taught, we also know that he, God, will force no one into a sealing relationship against his or her will. The blessings of a sealed relationship are assured for all who keep their covenants, but never by forcing a sealed relationship on another person who is unworthy or unwilling. What is the vertical bond referred to by President Nelson? The vertical bond is one we make with God. To keep the vertical bond with God, we are true to the temple covenants we have made regarding the laws of obedience sacrifice, the gospel, chastity, and consecration. We also covenant with God to receive our eternal companion and to be a righteous spouse and and parent. As we keep the vertical bond, we qualify for the blessings of being part of the family of God through the Abrahamic covenant, including the blessings of posterity, the gospel, and the priesthood. These blessings are also the fruit that remains. Well, we hope that all who enter into the new and everlasting covenant remain true and have the blessings sealed upon them for all eternity. Sometimes that ideal seems beyond our reach. Throughout my ministry, I have encountered members who who make and keep covenants, but their spouse does not. There are also those who are single, never having the opportunity to marry in mortality. And there are those who are not faithful to their marriage covenants. What happens to individuals in each of these circumstances? If you remain faithful to the covenants you have made when you were endowed, you will receive the personal blessings promised to you in the endowment even if your spouse has broken his or her covenants or withdrawn from the marriage. If you are sealed and later divorced, and if your sealing is not canceled, the personal blessings of that sealing remain in effect for you if you remain faithful. 
Sometimes, due to feelings of betrayal and very real hurt, a faithful spouse may want to cancel their sealing with their unfaithful spouse to get as far away as possible from them, both on earth and for eternity. If you are concerned that you will somehow be tied to an unrepentant former spouse, remember, you will not. God will not require anyone to remain in a sealed relationship throughout eternity against his or her will. Heavenly Father will ensure that we will receive every blessing that our desires and choices allow. However, if a cancellation of sealing is desired, agency is respected. Certain procedures can be followed, but this should not be done casually. The First Presidency holds the keys to bind on earth and in heaven. Once a sealing cancellation has been granted by the First Presidency, the blessings related to that sealing are no longer in force. They are canceled both laterally and vertically. It is important to understand that to receive the blessings of exaltation, we must demonstrate that we are willing to enter into and faithfully keep this new and everlasting covenant, either in this life or the next. For those who are single members of the Church, please remember that in the Lord's own way and time, no blessing will be withheld from His faithful saints. The Lord will judge and reward each individual according to heartfelt desires as well as deed. If you have not remained faithful to temple covenants, is there hope? Yes! The gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel of hope. That hope comes through Jesus Christ with sincere repentance and obediently following Christ's teachings. I have seen individuals make grave mistakes breaking sacred covenants. On a regular basis, I see those who sincerely repent are forgiven and return to the covenant path. If you have broken your temple covenants, I urge you to turn to Jesus Christ, counsel with your bishop, repent, and open your soul to the mighty healing power available because of the Atonement of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, our loving Heavenly Father has given us covenants so that we may have access to all that He has in store for us. These sacred blessings from God are more delicious than any earthly fruit. They can be preserved for us forever, becoming fruit that remains as we are faithful to our covenants. I testify that God has restored the authority to bind on earth so it is bound in heaven. That authority is found in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It is held by the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve and is exercised under the direction of President Russell M. Nelson. Those who enter into the new and everlasting covenant of marriage and keep that covenant can become perfected and eventually receive the fullness of the glory of the Father regardless of circumstances beyond their control. These promised blessings appertaining to our covenants can be sealed upon us by the Holy Spirit of promise and become fruit that remains forever and ever. I so testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're grateful for all who have spoken to us this evening and for the truly beautiful music that's been provided. We remind you that the nationwide broadcast of Music in the Spoken Word will air tomorrow morning from 9.30 to 10 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time. The Saturday morning session of conference will immediately follow. Our concluding speaker for this session will be Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf, of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Following Elder Uchtdorf's remarks, the choir will close this meeting by singing Amazing Grace. The benediction will then be offered by Brother Milton Camargo, who serves as first counselor in the Sunday School General Presidency.
I've had the uh, great blessing of speaking at General Conference for three decades now. During that time, I've been asked questions relating to these messages by many around the world. Lately, one particular question keeps coming up. It usually goes something like this. At Oakdorf, I listened carefully to your last talk, but I didn't hear anything about aviation. <laughs> well, after today, I hope I hear that question uh, no more for a while. <laughs> it's hard to believe it was only 120 years ago when Wilbur and Orville Wright first lifted off and flew over the sands of Kitty Hawk, <laughs> North Carolina. Four short flights on that December day changed the world and opened the door to one of the greatest inventions in the world's history. Flying was risky in those early days. The brothers knew this, and so did their father, Milton. In fact, he was so terrified of losing both of his sons in a flying accident that they promised him they would never fly together. And they never did, with one exception. Seven years after that historic day at Kitty Hawk, Milton Wright finally gave his consent and watched as Wilbur and Orville flew together for the first time. After landing, Orville convinced his father to take his first and only flight and to see for himself what it was like. As the plane lifted from the ground, the 82-year-old Milton got so caught up in the acceleration of flight that all fear left him. Orville rejoiced as his father shouted with delight, higher, Orville, higher. This was a man after my own heart. <laughs> Perhaps the reason I speak about aviation occasionally is that I know something of what the Wrights felt. I too have slipped the surely bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter silvered wings. The Wright brothers' first flight, which happened a mere 37 years before my birth, opened doors of adventure, wonder, and pure joy into my life. And yet, as amazing as that joy is, there's an even higher kind of joy. Today, in the spirit of Milton Wright's delighted cry, higher, Orville, higher, I would like to speak about this higher joy, where it comes from, how it enters our hearts, and how we can experience it in greater measure. It probably goes without saying that everyone wants to be happy. Nevertheless, it goes also without saying that not everyone is happy. Sadly, it seems that for many people, happiness is hard to find. Why is that? If happiness is the one thing we humans desire most, why are we so unsuccessful at finding it? To paraphrase a country song, maybe we've been looking for joy in all the wrong places. Before we discuss how to find joy, allow me to acknowledge that depression and other difficult mental and emotional challenges are real. And the answer is not simply try to be happier. My purpose today is not to diminish or trivialize mental health issues. If you face such challenges, I mourn with you and I stand beside you. For some people, finding joy may include seeking help from trained mental health professionals who devote their lives to practicing their very important art. We should be thankful for such help. Now, life is not an endless sequence of emotional highs, for it must be that there is an opposition in all things. And if God himself weeps, 
As the scripture affirm, he does. Then, of course, you and I will weep as well. Feeling sad is not a sign of failure. In this life, at least, joy and sorrow are inseparable companions. Like all of you, I have felt my share of disappointment, sorrow, sadness, and remorse. However, I've also experienced for myself the glorious dawn that fills the soul with joy, so profound that it can scarcely be kept in. I have discovered for myself that this peaceful confidence comes from following the Savior and walking in His way. The peace He gives us is not like what the world gives. It's better. It's higher and holier. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. The gospel of Jesus Christ is truly the good news of great joy. It is a message of matchless hope, a message of yoke-bearing and burden-lifting, of light-gathering, of heavenly favor, higher understanding, holier covenants, eternal security, and everlasting glory. Joy is the very purpose of God's plan for His children. It's what you were created for, that you might have joy. You were built for this. Our Father in heaven has not hidden the path to happiness. It's not a secret. It's available to all. It is promised to those who walk the path of discipleship, follow the teaching and example of the Savior, keep His commandments, make and honor covenants they make with God. What a remarkable promise. We all know people who say that they don't need God to be happy, that they are happy enough without religion. I acknowledge and respect these feelings. Our beloved Father in Heaven wants all His children to have as much happiness as possible. So He has filled this world with beautiful, wholesome pleasures and delights, both to please the eye and gladden the heart. For me, flying brought great happiness. Others find it in music, in art, in hobbies, or nature. By inviting everyone and sharing the Savior's good news of great joy, we do not discount only these sources of joy, any of those. We are simply saying that God has something more to give, a higher and more profound joy, a joy that transcends anything this world offers. It is a joy that endures heartbreak, penetrates sorrow, and diminishes loneliness. Worldly happiness, by contrast, does not last. It cannot. It is the nature of all earthly things to grow old, decay, wear out, or become stale. But godly joy is eternal, because God is eternal. Jesus Christ came to lift us out of the temporal and replace corruption with incorruption. Only He has that power, and only His joy is perpetual. If you feel there could be more of this kind of joy in your life, I invite you to embark on the journey of following Jesus Christ and His way. It is a journey of a lifetime and beyond. Please let me suggest a few beginning steps on this worthy journey of discovering pure joy. Do you remember the women in the New Testament who endured a bleeding illness for 12 years? She had spent all she had on physicians, but things only grew worse. She had heard of Jesus. His power to heal was well known, but could He heal her? And how could she even get near him. Her sickness made her unclean, according to the law of Moses, and therefore she was required to stay away from others. 
Approaching him openly and asking for healing seemed out of the question. Still, she thought, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. At last, her faith overcame her fear. She braved the censure of others and pressed toward the Savior. Finally, she was within reach. She extended her hand and she was healed. Aren't we all somewhat like this woman? There may be many reasons why we hesitate to draw near to the Savior. We may face ridicule or condemnation by others. In our pride, we may dismiss the possibility of something so simple being of so much value. We may think that our condition somehow disqualifies us from his healing, that the distance is too great or our sins too many. Like this woman, I have learned that if we draw near to God and reach out to touch him, we can indeed find healing, peace, and joy. Jesus taught, seek, and ye shall find. I believe this simple phrase is not only a spiritual promise. I believe it is a statement of fact. If we seek reasons to be angry, to doubt, to be bitter or alone, we will find them. However, if we seek joy, if we look for reasons to rejoice and to happily follow the Savior, we will find them too. We rarely find something we are not looking for. Are we looking for eternal joy? Seek, and ye shall find. Jesus taught, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Can it be that in our search for joy, the best way to find is to bring joy to others? Brothers and sisters, you know and I know this is true. Joy is like a barrel of flour or a jar of oil that will never run out. True joy multiplies when it is shared. It doesn't require something grand or complicated. We can do simple things like praying for someone with all our heart, giving a sincere compliment, helping someone feel welcome, respected, valued, and loved, sharing a favorite scripture and what it really means to us, or even just by listening. When you are in the service of your fellow beings, you are only in the service of your God and God will repay your kindness generously. The joy you give to others will return to you in good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over. During the coming days, weeks and months, may I invite you to spend time in a sincere, full-hearted effort to draw near to God. Seek diligently for everyday moments of hope, peace, and joy. Bring joy to others around you. My dear brothers and sisters, dear friends, as you search the word of God for a deeper understanding of God's eternal plan, accept these invitations and strive to walk in his way, you will experience the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Even in the midst of sores, you will feel a greater measure of God's unsurpassable love, love swelling within your heart. The dawn of celestial light will penetrate the shadows of your trials, and you will begin to taste the unspeakable glories and wonders of the unseen perfect heavenly sphere. You will feel your spirit lifting away from the gravity of this world. And like good Milton Wright, perhaps you will raise your voice 
in rejoicing and shout, higher, Father, higher. May we all seek and find the higher joy that comes from devoting our lives to our Heavenly Father and His beloved Son. This is my earnest prayer and blessing in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Kind Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this blessing we have 
today and especially in this session of the conference to be edified and inspired by the words we have heard from the general leaders of thy church, from prophets, seers, and revelators. We are so thankful for the blessing we have to live the gospel, restored gospel of Jesus Christ, and have the opportunity to raise our families in this gospel. Dear Father, we pray for the membership of the church, thy covenant people. We pray thou can bless them, bless all of us in uh, our challenges and trials and tribulations that we can all receive the miracles we all need in each one of our lives. We pray that we can be better and serve thee better and be more faithful to the covenants we have done with thee. And we pray that we can rejoice in the gospel in a higher and a holier way in thy son, Jesus Christ. We pray for our children, our grandchildren, great-grandchildren, all of the rising generation, that they can be touched by the Holy Ghost and feel they are thy children and understand the mission thou hast prepare for them in this life and move on in their lives faithful to thee and to thy son. We are so thankful for all of the blessings and we pray humbly in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This has been a broadcast of the Saturday evening session of the 194th Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from leaders of the church. Music for this session was provided by the Utah Valley Institute Choir. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited.